Okay, hello everyone, and today's lecture we're going to discuss about the simulation of the diffusion process. So if you can recall in the last lecture, you had the basics of the diffusion process, so you have the mathematical background of it, so there were some uh, formulas and etc. So we have this background information, so what we're trying to do uh, today is to put this into action. So we will, first I'm going to describe you about the motivation behind the simulation of this nanoscale environment and uh, I will try to uh, give some examples about the simulations that uh, were covered like last, uh, last chapter in the last uh, lecture. Okay. So uh, before starting the motivation of the simulation of the scale, first I want to give you some feeling about the scale that we're talking about. Okay, so this is from a website, hdwins.net, so there is a uh, interactive uh, tool there, you can also have a look, so I took some snapshots. So this is the observable universe and I want to take your attention on the scale, okay, this is 10 to the power 27. So this is uh, how big the universe is uh, as of today's knowledge, okay, so this is quite big. And then I'm going to skip all these uh, galaxies, planets, stars, etc. And we come to our level, okay? So this is, let's say, uh, one meter. Okay, it is like humans, some animals, and etc. And what we're talking was about like nanoscales, but we also said that there are these things in microscales as well. So I go one level down, so this is like now millimeters, okay? So if you can see, there's already some big bacteria appearing, okay? Some familiar things like grain of salt, some ants, and etc. We go, now it's like 100 uh, millimeters, uh, okay? So it's already human hair, so smaller than that we cannot see. As you can see, there is also the, some skin cell, so cells start appearing. And if you go one level, 10 to the minus 5, there is already this white blood cells, red blood cell, something similar. And if you go to minus six, now we are in micrometer. Virus appeared, you see, this is largest virus. Okay. And if you go to the nanometer, now this is what we were mostly talking about, for instance, some molecules. In the last lecture, there was this carbon nanotube. If you can recall, it was the diameter was around one nan uh, nanometer. So this is the scale that we're talking about, okay? So like the cells, molecules, they are in some environments and they are trying to communicate. Of course, you know, we can go uh, a bit more, 10 to the minus 18. If you can see, there is already this quantum and etc. Actually, it goes a bit more. If you're interested, you can have a look. So this was the introduction because I wanted to give you this feeling because as I said, now we're talking about a different scale. And we're also talking about a different environment. So when we're talking about the communication, like electromagnetic waves and etc., now we are in a complete different environment. Okay, there is fluids and there is different dynamics. So why this is important? If we want to have a laboratory, okay, so the bad news is that we cannot take our sensor networks laboratory, WiMAX laboratory or whatever and directly use or transform it into such use, okay? So we need to have uh, more sophisticated laboratories and if, I mean, you can understand that these laboratories should be cross-domain as well. So we will need people from biology, maybe we will need people from chemistry. So that's why setting up such a laboratory will be really costly. Even if you set up this, I mean, running it, running experiments, they will all be very costly. So that's why even if you have a real laboratory, most of the theories or like the new ideas and etc. First, you will want to execute a simulation for it. If, like, after these simulations, maybe some of these ideas which are really good, you will try to still go to the laboratory, but the first step in most of the cases will be the simulation. So that's why we also need simulators, and the bad news is that we cannot also take the existing simulators and directly use, right? So we have like NS2, NS3, OpNet, if you're aware. So there are different simula uh, simulators for the traditional communication uh, paradigm, but you know, we cannot directly take them and use them. That's why we need to either develop some additional components for the simulators, or we need to develop our own simulators for this new communication uh, mechanism, okay? So that's why 
simulation is really an important aspect as in the other fields of this uh, nanoscale communication. So what we said, you know, the characteristics are different. So we're talking about the fluids, like fluid environment and the carrier wave pro properties of the environment is different. So we said, okay, and we agreed that we need a different type of a simulator, right? Then what we need to consider. So when we're developing a simulator for the nanoscale, specifically today's topic, we will concentrate on the simulation of the molecular communication and in more detail, uh, communication via diffusion. Okay, so we will put this diffusion terminology, methodology into uh, real world examples. So when you are trying to develop such a simulation, or such a simulator, you need to concentrate on the five steps uh, of a communication process. So first there will be encoding or modulation. Okay, so you have an information and then you need to transform this information into signals. And when you have the signals, then you will need to simulate the transmission process. So in our case, in molecular communication, this means the release of the molecules okay, to the environment. And then you need to simulate the propagation of these molecules in the environment. And afterwards, there will be the reception process. You will also need to simulate this reception process. And when the signal is received by the receiver nano machine, then you will need to perform the decoding to access the information, okay? So we need to consider all the different steps of this communication process when we try to develop a simulator, okay? So now I will try to focus some functional requirements of this uh, molecular communication. So we need to think about how we need to develop the uh, different parts of the simulator, right? For instance, so I will try to touch each uh, topic. Of course, this will not be the whole list based on your uh, innovative idea or whatever, so you may need some different things, but these are some basic topics that you may need to consider while developing a simulator for the uh, nanoscale com uh, molecular communication. Okay. So we start from the environment. So our nanomachines, our molecules, they will reside in an environment. So when we need to develop the simulator, we need to abstract this environment. While creating the environment, one of the important parameters or one of the important uh, aspects is whether we're going to simulate a confined space or unconfined space. So what do I mean? Uh, if you can recall this theoretical uh, background, there were these theoretical works and we were assuming that we have an infinite space, okay? while the reception. If we want to simulate such an environment, we, uh, we may want to simulate the molecules which can like walk around or go around uh, in an unconfined space till the infinity, okay? But in some situations, in a more real world situations like in your body, we don't have a like infinite space, right? So we have a closed environment. So in such cases, we need to model the confined space environment. And for a confined space environment, we still need some uh, decision parameters. For instance, what's going to happen if the molecule comes to the edge of your medium? Okay, so what's going, what you're going to do? Will you just remove it from the simulation environment or will it bounce back so you will still keep it? So based on your model or based on what you're going to simulate, you may need different implementations for your uh, medium implementation, okay? Uh, another thing is what is going to be your environment parameters. We talked about some constants, right? So there were temperature, like diffusion coefficients, so there were these different parameters of the diffusion coefficients, so it was affecting the uh, diffusion process. Of course, you will need to model those, but I have not listed those because these are more constants. So based on what real world uh, problem you are modeling, you will go check and select the right constant. So that's not a big issue. But uh, also in the examples, I will focus on the time step. Time step. Because uh, when you model your time step, the accuracy of the simulation increases as you model smaller time steps, okay? If you model milliseconds or if you model microseconds, you may have different results. I will also show this with uh, an example today so you will have an understanding why time steps is, is quite critical. And the last thing about the environment in general is about how you are going to manage collusion. 
For instance, um, uh, if you have a transmitter, the transmitter will release a molecule, right? So your transmitter I'm going to talk about it can be some point, you can abstract it as a point, or it can be some sphere. So what's going to happen if this molecule goes back and like hits to the transmitter? Okay? Or if you have multiple transmitters and multiple receivers, if it goes to a, a, a receiving nanomachine of another molecule, what's going to happen? Or if you uh, will model the collision among the molecules. So will they collide or will you assume that you know they simply can exist in the same place? And how you implement this collision? So it's going to be a simple algorithm, it's going to be an elastic collision, like some physics only, or you're going to consider the chemical reactions among the molecules. So based on what you're going to model, as you can imagine, the complexity of the simulation can uh, can go quite high. So this is another topic that you may you may need to consider while designing your simulator. So the next thing is the transmitter. So we will have the transmitters, as I said. So especially if we are going to compare our an, uh, analytical model, in most of the analytical uh, cases we have the point sources. Okay, so the transmitter is like a point which releases molecules. So that's why you may want to have a point source. Okay. Or you may want to implement a spherical transmitter. So this is quite a good abstraction of the existing cells or something. But of course, not all the cells or not all of the uh, nano machines will be of this shape. So you may want some other shapes of the transmitter. So this also increases the complexity. Again, it depends on what you are going to simulate. And uh, in the transmitter, transmission points. You have a transmitter, let's say it's not a point transmitter, it's a sphere. How you are going to transmit your molecules from single point on a transmitter? Or, you will, or will you have more than one point releasing the same molecule? Or let's say if, you have, if your transmitter is capable of transmitting more than one type of molecule, how are you going to implement, like one point for each? So you will have, as, as you can understand, there are different alternatives. So Again, based on your model, you may want to implement different uh, approaches. So, of course, the best is to implement everything, but it's subject to time and uh, the budget. And the last thing is about the transmission period. So, what I refer as transmission period is, again, you can make an abstraction and you can say that at simulation time x, at that instant time, I release x molecules, like 1,000 molecules. But of course, you know, in real time, uh, in real world, it's not going to be instantaneous, but maybe it's going to take one millisecond or like one microsecond or whatever. So this means that how you are, go you are modeling the exact uh, transmission period. Okay? So it's like instant or it's like gradually increases over time. Okay? So these are some uh, points that you may consider while designing your transmitter. And then the next thing after you transmit, you have the molecules in the environment, so this is also where we are mostly going to focus. And these are going to diffuse in the environment. So then you need to model this. And uh, from the last lecture, you can recall that how we can model it uh, is with uh, a random walk process. Okay? So in each dimension, the, in each time, stamp, uh, time step, the uh, delta displacement in each dimension can be calculated to be a normal distribution with a mean zero and with a standard deviation to the delta t, right? Okay, so this is what we're going to implement also, like what we're going to show today. If you implement such a model, then based on your time step, time step at each time step, you can calculate where your molecule will be you know, in the next time step. So at time zero, let's say it is here. So based on this model, you can calculate where your molecule is going to be at uh, the next millisecond. Okay? And you can run your simulator for, uh, let's say, one second, and then you will have a like walking molecule. So this is what we're trying to model today. And the Next thing to consider is the receiver, modeling the receiver. So molecules have been propagated into the environment and then they are going to be received by the receiver. Right? So what we can consider while designing our receiver 
Uh, here again, of course, a sphere is like an approximation. It's a good approximation, and we mostly use sphere. Uh, or still, you may have other type of nano machines, so with different shapes. So you may want to model such as well. And then the next thing is about the reception, uh, reception model. So you can again abstract a receiving nano machine to say that whenever your mo molecule hits the receiver, okay, it's the receiver surface, it's going to be received absorbed by the receiver. Or if you want to be more realistic, if you want to implement the more real world scenarios, you may try to implement receptors. Okay? So like this, in, in your uh, nano machine, in the surface there will be receptors of different sizes. Okay? So only when the molecule binds with this receptor, then you will assume that the molecule is being received. Okay? So this is another topic. And the last one, uh, we can mention the reception behavior because there are different type of, in, in the nature, there are different types of uh, cells or receptors. So in one type, for instance, when the molecule is uh, received by the receptor, it is taken into the cell and it's being destroyed. Okay? So then in your simulator, you can implement this and you can assume that the cell is moved from the simulation environment. But in, another, in some other cases, what happens is that when the molecule binds to the receptor, this already triggers the action, and the molecule is then received afterwards. Okay? So it's not taken into the cell. So it just simply binds and triggers an action, and this molecule is then destroyed by some other means. So the transmitter, let's say, releases another type of molecule which destroys that molecule. Okay? So based on what you're going to implement, you may need in your simulator different type of receptors as well. So you may completely omit the receptors. You can think that all the surface is kind of a receptor. You can implement receptors which takes the molecules or you can implement a receptor which like binds and then after a threshold time then just releases the molecule back. Okay? So these are some design criteria for the receiver side. So these were more or less the functional requirements I mentioned. Now, uh, here I will try to focus on uh, the simulation process, as I call. So what is a simulation process? So when we have a research project or research uh, topic, okay, what we need to do is, before starting the simulation, we need to plan what we're going to do. Okay? And in the simulation process, there will be two stages. So the first one will be simulator design, and the next one will be the simulation execution plan. Okay? When I call the simulation design, I both mention the previous functional requirements and I will also describe some non-functional requirements. Okay? And when I talk about the execution plan, I am trying to refer to the case where what kind of input sets you will try to test, how many times you will need to test. So for statistically, re, uh, st 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 statistically meaningful uh, results, how many simulations you will need to execute, so on and so forth. So these two are really important because if you just jump into your simulation implementation and just start running some whatever executions, and they take time, I mean, a couple of days, couple of weeks sometimes, and at the end, you realize that, okay, you miss a parameter, or you, know, you need to take another run which will take you know, two more weeks. So that's why it's very important that you focus on this in the, I mean, you invest time, uh, invest time in the beginning for this planning uh, stage so that at the end you will have more meaningful results. Okay, so as I say, these, the simulation in general takes a lot of time you know, in your overall research project. That's why focusing and planning it in advance will, uh, will benefit from time perspective. Okay? So I say simulation design and the simulation execution plan. So simulation design, what I have described previously was more or less the functional requirements. Okay, so like how the transmitter is going to be, how the receiver is going to be, and it depends on your problem. It's not a complete list as well. So you may come up, uh, come up with a brilliant idea, and you know you may want to implement something completely different, you know, in this domain. That's one thing. But when we talk about the non-functional requirements, so there are you know other things than the real functionality which are important for your simulator design. For instance, flexibility. So nobody wants a simulator with some hard-coded parameters, right? For example, so you want this to be configurable. So 
you want some new modules to be integrated into it easily. So when you design for development or when you, if you want to take an existing simulator, first you need to assess them. So is it really flexible that you, know, you can implement what you want? Is it modular enough? So the next thing is interoperability. So it is important if you are not a you know, single person but a research team, maybe distributed in the world, then you know, different people want to develop with different programming languages or they, wanna, they may have different infrastructure for the execution. So it's a good uh, feature if this simulator is capable of running on different environments and if the modules can be developed with different programming languages. Okay, so that's another topic. Reusability is also very, very important because if we are talking about, again, a big research project or like a collaboration of people all around the world, we don't want the same functionality to be implemented again and again. I mean, if we have, if we have a flexible uh, structure, if we have a flexible architecture, then what we want is um, all around the world, different people should be able to implement different functionality, so you implement one receptor uh, and we put it into our simulator, you know, then everybody else can use it, so you implement another type of receptor and we can also put it into our simulator, so via configuration people you know, can start using it. So that is another important uh, criteria. And the last one is scalability. That, why it is important? Because we said, no, we are uh, working with these small, small molecules and ba again, based on your model, you may really have so many of them and if you want to implement things like collision, especially like elastic collision or chemical reactions or different type of receptors that I'm, I was talking about and also expand it into a simulation of not one transmitter and receiver but multiple of them so like then start thinking of simulating what's going on in your body so if you scale up, I mean if you uh, if you make the problem bigger, the computational, the comp uh, computational resources that you will need is going to increase as well. So if your simulator is like uh, not scalable, that, that you can only run it into single machine, then of course at some point you will hit some bottlenecks. That's why when you're designing your, of course based on your needs, if you don't need something very simple, if you need some feature-proof design, then you may consider like vertical and horizontal scalability which most probably bring you to some distributed competing type of architecture. Okay, so of course this is not in the very beginning maybe but based on the project needs you may need some distributed uh, implementation of, uh, of molecular communication simulation as well. Okay, so these were also more or less the non-functional requirements. Of course again this is not a complete list based on your needs what I was trying to tell here is that before implementing your project or before going into the research phase, first you need to understand what is your functional and unfunctional, uh, non-functional requirements. Based on that, you may, go to, you may go and make a search if there is anything available already that you can use, because there are some research groups has already some simulators that are available, or based on these needs, if there is nothing available, then you may start developing your own simulator. Okay. So we also said the simulation execution plan. Why it is important? Again, as I said, this takes real, really a long time and beforehand you need to plan what type of scenarios you will run, what type of inputs, what type of configurations you will need and for instance how long your input set, like your input signal should be how many times you need to repeat, like randomness, how many times you need to repeat, repeat such. So you need to plan those in advance so that at the end when you have the results you have something meaningful and you don't need to go back many times and run this cycle for weeks and you miss whatever deadlines for your research. Okay, so that's why it is important and by this way you can make sure that your results are also uh, statistically significant, okay, meaningful. And I also tried to put up this into a figure. Uh, so, as I said, it starts with the simulator design and simulation execution plan. So based on your simulator design, based on this functional and non-functional requirements, you will come up with a simulator. 
This can be an existing one if there is already something fulfilling your needs. If there is nothing, unfortunately, you will need to start a new project to develop this, okay? And uh, when you have your simulator, based on the execution plan, again, based on your statistical needs, based on your output needs, you will create a set of inputs. Then you are ready to go. I mean, you put your inputs to your simulator, then it depends on how much uh, processing power you have, and after a while, maybe hours, maybe days, maybe weeks, whatever, you will have the output set. And when you have the output sets, you will perform an analysis because, okay, you first had an idea and you created some maybe analytical model out of it, right? So you have some formulas and now you want to test it in the simulation. You go into this cycle and at the end you have some outputs and in your analysis you verify that your outputs uh, proves your theory or your analytical work. So if there is a deviation, if there is a problem, most probably there will be these feedback loops. Maybe there was a problem with your design, right? So you may need to reconfigure or develop or like bug fixing on your simulator. Or it can be simply about, your, about a problem in your simulation execution plan. Then you may need to go back, maybe add some additional runs, maybe change some uh, configuration parameters, etc. So you go into this cycle again. So if you can understand, I mean, based on how long this takes, if it is weeks, you will not want to make so much cycles because it will take a lot of time. That's why I again try to mention that designing those before, beforehand, before starting the real implementation will, will benefit a lot uh, from time perspective. Okay? So in the second part uh, of, the, of the presentation, I am going to cover some real world examples uh, from the previous lecture. Uh, but maybe before that we give a short break. Okay, in the second part we will go over some simulation uh, of the concept that was introduced last, in the last uh, lecture. So it, I will first start with the microscopic theory and then I will go to this diffusion to capture, this microscopic one. So if you can recall there was this one dimensional random walk, it was introduced last week. And there was this simulation exercise for interested. I'm sure everybody did it, but just to make sure that we have a common understanding, this I'm going to repeat. And in the same simulation, I will also cover this next one. There was also this exercise. And uh, here the idea was to show you that when you release the molecules, let's say from, we are in one dimension first, okay? X exists, uh, exists. So we release the molecules from the center and then they start making a random walk with uh, one, uh, 0 0.5 probability a molecule switch to right, to the positive side, let's say, and with 0 0.5 probability it goes to the left, okay? So they start moving around and what, we, what was the conclusion was that, you know, on average nobody walks, I mean, because if you take the mean, they will be in the center. If there is a particle going to three steps right, there will be another one going to three steps left, okay? So this we will try to see. And in the second one, it is shown that, you know, here, if you wait for one second, you will have such a distribution. So as you can see, most of the molecules will be around the center, and the deviation will be like this. So if you uh, run the simulation for four seconds here, so you will have less numbers in the center. Of course, you know, they will start uh, going to the sides, okay? And uh, here, you know, it says that their peak heights decreases with the square, square root of the time. So if you wait, you know, if you wait, uh, if you run it for two seconds, it will not go half, okay? So if you wait only four seconds, then they will, uh, the, the, the number of molecules in the center will be halved, okay? So, uh, again, this code or this uh, logic that I'm going to show here is only to demonstrate you the basics. That's why it's tried to be compact, so it's not a well-designed software piece of code or something. So just to give you a feeling, okay? So I will also execute it. So what we will have is we will have five classes, simulation parameters, where I will hard code some parameters that we are going to use. 
and the uh, molecule uh, dot Java to abstract the molecule itself and the environment here it will be you know like one dimensional uh, x-axis anyway and it will keep the molecules and uh, this diffusion 1D is the main uh, program okay it keeps track of the time execution time and the last one I will not cover but it's just like a Java Swing implementation so it's just to visualize uh, the outputs for us to, to analyze. Okay, so the simulation parameters for 1D, here I will not go into the diffusion coefficients or something, so we assume that we have x-axis and we have discrete uh, steps, okay, so the step size is 1, so it goes 1 step. So we will have 5000 molecules that's going to be released from the center, okay, from zero origin. So the simulation time actually we are going to play around. So we will see you know, what happens if it is 100, what happens if it is 400. So we will try to understand if we can really uh, monitor such a behavior. Okay. So time step, time step is one here, like you, we can think that it's in milliseconds or whatever. So it means that we run it for instance for 1.6 seconds here in this case. So I also add a sleep time for, for us to see what's going on, you know, otherwise it just runs and we see the result. So it means that it, after each step, if, uh, after each time step, so the simulation sleeps for 10 uh, milliseconds here for us to visualize, okay? So, and we also need a random variable, so that's what we use. So it's actually very, very simple. So we have a molecule and we have the x-axis, right? So we have some additional get and set methods. We don't uh, care too much. And of course the molecule changed the location. So we have a simple uh, method here. So with uh, 0 0.5 probability, it goes to the right. Okay, with 0 0.5 probability, it goes to the left. Simple, easy. And in the propagation environment, since we have hard-coded, uh, again, you know, we don't go with some data structures. We have a simple uh, array. And uh, we keep, like in this case, 5,000 molecules here. And we have a simple method to advance time. So at each time step, we execute this in the environment. So the environment is uh, responsible for moving the molecules. So it just goes over the array for each molecule. It uh, updates its location. So by this way, at each time step, the molecule starts moving to the right or to the left. So if, from here. Okay. So this is the main program. So here we keep track of the simulation time, okay? And we run it uh, to the configured parameter and we update it with the time step, as you can see. And we create a propagation environment. So for each time step, we call the advanced time function of the propagation environment. And uh, here in this part, uh, we will also distribute the code to you in the course website, but in this part we have some GUI related code. It's not very critical for us to understand the main logic. And here we again update the paint the results in the output. And as I said, after each step we simply sleep for us to visually see the output. As you can see that is really a very very simple implementation. Okay, before going to this, let's try to run and see how it works. Ah, oh, okay, good. Okay, so this is the parameters. First, as you can see, I will execute it with 100 steps, okay? Ah, okay, and the sleep time is 100 milliseconds, so it's going to take a bit. So as you can see, now what we can monitor is, let me try to describe what we plot here. So these ones, this is the x-axis, okay? These are the molecules. Of course, you know, there are so many molecules, so it's not possible to visually like plot them. So we simply see that they are a bit moving and going around. So from the center, they just go around to the right and to the left. And this plot shows the number of molecules at this point, okay? So for instance here we have, uh, okay, I don't, we don't have the specific uh, values, but as you can see here, we can more or less
see this pattern, right? So we first now executed it for 100. So now let's try it with, okay, let's put it into here so that we can compare. I will run it for 400 and I will also decrease this so that it runs a bit faster. Okay, finished. So as you can see, now if we wait a bit more, it's, oops. So if we wait a bit more, now pay attention that we did not double, but it's like four times the first one, but the number of molecules nearly halved for the center, and now we have the molecules distributed to a wider area. But still, if we take the, I mean, if we see the distribution, we can say that it's going to be, the mean will be around zero, right? So there will be more molecules in the centers and there will be less ones around the corners. So, let's, Also execute for 16. So as you can see here, now the molecules are simply like moving to the right, left, right, left, and you know here we cannot see the details like how many are there, but this plot shows how many molecules exist at each point. So as you can see, still, you know, if we keep, we wait a bit more, still, of course, uh, they are uh, clustered in the center with a normal distribution. Let's also plot this. And finally, let's also make it 64, also to see what happens if it really goes half again. Okay, this will take a bit more. So here, the time is 100, it's 400, 1600, 6400. So as you can see, as time passes, you know, with this random walk, they go to the right, left, they move, but at the end, we still keep this normal distribution here. And uh, with the square root of the time, this, the number of uh, molecules around the center gets half, okay? So if you, if you want to wait, you know, a bit, okay, now finish. So if you want to see, you know, to have it halved as well, so we need to go one step further. It's gonna take a bit more, but you know, the, and again, we did this test with 5,000, right? So you may do it with much larger number of molecules, and then you can repeat it many times. You can take the average, and at the end, you will see the distribution will be, will be normal. So you, know, you can play around with these statistics. You, know, you can take the code and play around with this uh, number of molecules to make some statistical analysis, okay? So let's switch back. So the second, uh, also from the previous lecture, there was another uh, exercise, let's say, simulation exercise for the interested. And here I will also try to uh, show you the effect of this time step, okay? So 
Here that is a plot of a particle, that's a single particle. It just shows the plot you know, of its movement. So it says that it is simulated for 18,050 steps. Okay? And as you can see, it just goes around. And in these black regions, it travels a lot and then goes to here. It travels a lot. And at the end, it goes from the like bird flow 190 steps. Okay? So if we want to implement such, again, we will have more or less the same uh, classes. Okay? Just now, I introduced the diffusion coefficient. So this mathematics that we have seen last week. So I took this uh, from one of the previous works that is for a specific environment, let's say. So you can take different based on your needs. And here, I take one milliseconds for the time step. Okay? And if you can recall, the sigma for the normal distribution of this uh, random walk was square root of 2d delta t. Okay, so here I use it. So I simulate for 10 seconds here. And again, we have some sleep time so that we see what's going on. So we will play around with these parameters again to see uh, how it behaves. So just one thing that we added, second dimension, why? And also in this one, we are not interested to keep track of like so many molecules. We will keep track of one molecule. That's why, you know, we, uh, and we want to keep track of the path. That's why I also want to know the previous coordinates of it. So I add another parameter for this. And in update location, so I simply update the previous log condition, uh, previous coordinates, okay? And the next one is to decide on the next coordinate. So we said how we can decide. So there is this uh, delta added, the displacement, and this is simply a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and uh, sigma, okay? So here we also have a function for this, and we use the standard next Gaussian uh, method of the Java random library. So we simply create a random variable with uh, mean zero and uh, variance sigma, and we simply add it to x and y coordinates. Of course, this can be positive or negative. So after each step, based on this uh, normal distribution, our molecule will walk around in this 2D space. Okay? So in propagation environment, you know, we used to have an array, but as I said, here our aim is different, so we keep track of one molecule, it's very easy. And uh, in this uh, 2D uh, class, more or less, it is the same thing, okay? So this is the executable of the class, and again here there is some stuff for the uh, visual part for the GUI, which I'm going to speak, uh, skip. It's not important for our case. Okay, again, let's try to switch. Let's close these things. Okay, we see good. So let's switch to 2D. this tight. I think I will restart this. Okay, let's check the first parameters. Okay, let's time step like this. Okay, now the time step is one uh, millisecond. Okay, and I run the simulation for 10 seconds and I sleep 100 milliseconds at each step. So let's. Okay, as you can see, now our particle started moving. So now the time step is one millisecond. Okay, so now try to you know feel how 
far it gets, of course, you know, we can see that at some points it goes like a small distance, at some it's a bit larger, but it's because of the variance. But still, you know, every step size we have a, we have a feeling. So, and we can monitor a similar behavior as we have seen in the lecture, okay? So, now let's stop and just, again, the same thing. Let's let it run a bit faster. I wanted first to, for you to see. So now it's just same thing, just runs a bit faster. And you should like notice that since it's a random movement and we have a different seat for the random variable, at each run it goes completely different path, okay? Let's again start to see the, this difference. So this is again for you to visualize what's going on, okay? So this is more or less the movement of a single molecule in 2D. Just, of course, you can visualize in 3D. It's going to be more or less the same thing, just you add another dimension, okay? So as I said here, I want to mention a bit about the time step. So now I increase this time step to be 10 milliseconds, okay? And now let's see what is be the output. Okay, so more or less the same um, behavior, but we can feel that now the time steps, uh, the, now this distance it travels is a bit higher, right? So still it models the random walk, just we abstract the positions in every 10 milliseconds. So it's like taking snapshots. We take the snapshots of the particle every 10 milliseconds, and we think that this particle made a direct movement from this point to the other point. But of course, in reality, it made a more smooth movement, as we have seen previously, where the time step is one milliseconds. In reality, actually, it made a more continuous movement. So as we go a bit below, uh, if, we have if we take smaller time steps, then we get a bit closer to the, uh, to the reality. So if we can also take it like 100 milliseconds, then um, execute it. Okay, I think we just need to run it a bit uh, slower so that it can paint. As you see, now I increased a bit more and still it makes a similar movement, but we take the snapshots every 100 milliseconds, so it's still a movement. So if we have a re receptor in some region of this 2D space, whether uh, it is received or not may depend on the time step that we are simulating, okay? So this is, again, to give you a feeling about this diffusion in 2D. Okay, the last one, yeah. And uh, the next one in the lecture that was covered about the something that can be simulated easily is about the diffusion to capture, okay? So the idea behind was the, what is the probability that a particle is received if I'm releasing it from here, okay? And if this is a, a receiver which can receive the particle if the particle hits its surface, then what is the probability? And the result was that it can be written as R over R plus D. Okay, so that is a simple formula. But pay attention that this is for uh, infinite space. Okay, so you don't have any borders. It's unconfined space. And also, this result holds when uh, the time goes to infinity. So, of course, our simulation will only approximate to that one. So we have uh, more or less same, but just we have added this receiver. And in 3D, we don't have the visualization. We will simply check the probability, okay, to see if it is in line with the analytical model or not. So first simulation parameters. I think more or less the same stuff. Yeah. So just we have, we will test with 1,000 molecules. So it means that here we will release 1,000 molecules. And at the end of the simulation time, here it is one second. So I will play around this parameter mostly. After one second, okay, time step is one millisecond. And after one second, or you know, at different times, we will check how many of these 1,000 molecules is being received, which will give us the probability, okay? So 
uh, then we will compare it with this analytical uh, fo formula that I was telling, like R over R plus D. Okay, so let's see. Uh, the molecules, the only thing that we have added is like this Z dimension, the third dimension, and of course this uh, update location for the third dimension. Easy. Uh, if you can understand, we release everything from the center, like the origin, 0, 0, 0. And uh, we have, uh, okay, sorry, I think that's a mistake. This should be the receiver, okay? And the receiver has also coordinates. It's a spherical one. Uh, now you can understand that the radius is 10, and it is placed at position 11, so the distance is 1. Okay, so distance for, of the release point to the receiver is 1 and the radius of, uh, uh, of the receiver is 10, okay? So, and this class also keeps track of the number of molecules received so that we will compare with 1,000. So, okay, we will see after the simulation time how many of these has been received. And we have a very simple uh, method for, uh, for checking this. We check the Euclidean distance. We also assume that, okay, in some other simulations we uh, model the real uh, molecules like the small uh, sphere but here we also assume that the molecules are point like they don't have any radius so what we ch uh, do is we check the distance of the molecule to the center of the uh, receiver and if of course if it is equal to or smaller than the radius then it is received okay so otherwise it's not received and this is managed by the propagation environment, so it has an array of molecules, it has a receiver, so at each time step, it first updates the molecule location, and the molecule is set to null if it is received, so that we don't keep track of it, okay? So if it is not null, then its location is updated, and it is checked if uh, the receiver has received it, so if it is received anyway, it is set to null, it's removed from the environment. So Simple, so only an extension to 3D. We have a receiver and we check if it is received by the receiving nano machine. Okay. And this part is also similar to what we have. I simply write, uh, I did not include this, but it prints out the number of molecules sent, number of molecules received, and this probability of hit in the simulation. And it also writes the probability of hit uh, analytically, which is. Uh, we said it is r over r plus uh, distance, which will be 10 over 11. I think it should be around 0 0.909 something. Okay, so this is the theoretical uh, value that we should be monitoring. Okay, and it simply displays this information. Now let's also switch to the third simulation. Okay, let's first check the parameters. Okay, I don't... So, the time step is one millisecond. So, first I will run it for only 30 uh, milliseconds, okay? And let's see how many of the molecules will be received. So, here is the output. So, now we have sent 1,000 molecules and even in 30 milliseconds, as you can see, the distance is 1, so 478, so it is like around 0 0.5, with 0 0.5 probability, I mean the probability of hit is 0 0.5 in 30 milliseconds. So what is the analytical one? It is, uh, okay, so something similar, 0 0.9090, it goes on. So now let's simply increase it to 100 milliseconds and see of course, as I said, I mean, when we wait a bit more, more molecules will be received. So it was 480 something, and now it is 664. So as you see, we waited a bit more, and of course we are receiving more molecules, and we are approaching to the uh, analytical value. So let's run it for half a second. It again increased to seven. Of course, the speed of increase is, is a bit uh, less now because you know in the very beginning you know these molecules starts moving 
And of course, in the very beginning, since it's very close to the receiver, most of the molecules are received. Now they have started, you know, just imagine from the second example, they have started walking around. But if we wait a bit more, you know, some of them comes back and hits. But some of them goes a bit further. So if you wait a bit, a bit more, and then there is still a probability that, you know, these ones they, which are further will come back. But even if you wait, like, uh, a lot, it, we still have this theoretical limit so that, you know, most of them will not, not come back. I mean, 1% uh, will not come back and they will not hit to the receiver. Okay? So it was 760. And now let's run it for one second. Now it's already 853, so the probability is 0 0.85 more or less. So let's run it for two. Let's run it for 10 seconds. I don't know how long it will take. So now it is 0 0.6086. So as you see, it increases. So we can, I don't know how long it will take, but we can just run it for 100 seconds and see what will be the output. So, why it is important? Because, so now as you see, it is, uh, anyway, after 100 seconds, you know, it is reaching to this 0 0.9. So why this is important? Of course, if we want to create a communication channel out of it, you know, we will not send 100 molecules, 1,000 molecules, and we will wait for 100 seconds. So then, you know, this, uh, we will really have a very, very small, uh, slow channel. So the idea here is that, as you have seen, even after 50 milliseconds, uh, we already received half of the uh, molecules that we have sent. So the main problem or this, uh, one of the main problems that is being uh, studied is, you know, what should be uh, this time symbol, okay? so. Based on this, based on such analysis for different uh, distance, we need to define the uh, time uh, symbol time. Okay, so how long we should be waiting, and based on that, we also need to define the threshold. So if I wait, let's say for uh, 50 milliseconds, then I'm receiving, let's say, 60% of what I have sent. Then you know I can set my threshold to. 50%, right? So then if it is more than 50% or should I set it to 30%? You know, then this depends on an optimization problem uh, about the channel capacity. So based on this simulation results and the analysis, then we may come up with a communication channel model where we have a symbol duration, we have some threshold, and based on that, you know, we can, we can identify what will be the inter symbol interference, you know, the co-channel interface, and etc. Okay? So this was the last example that I wanted to show. Thank you.